Hi, I'm Lauren Wendell and welcome to the Lucy Talk series. The, the Lucy Foundation has a threefold message, which is to honor master photographers, to discover and cultivate emerging talent, and to promote the appreciation of photography worldwide. Our signature event is the Lucy Awards, which will be held in October online. Please go to the lucyfoundation.org to see all of our programs and information about the Lucy Awards. It is now my pleasure to introduce the panel, a live conversation with photographer and Lucy honoree, Maggie Stieber, artist and university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, Deborah Willis, and moderator, Al Dede Delgado, the Wolfa founder and director, Latinx art historian and curator. This presentation is hosted by both the Lucy Foundation and Wolfa, spelled W-O-P-H-A, Women Photographers International Archive, and leads up to the Wolfa Congress, Women, Photography, and Feminisms, taking place November 18th to 19th in Miami. Today's discussion will explore the artist's creative practice, including recent projects, academic work, and feminist practice. We encourage all of you to ask questions in the Q&A, which will be addressed at the end as time allows. It is now my pleasure to turn the Zoom mic over to Aldedede, Aldedede Delgado <laughs> and the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for this introduction. And thank you, Alice, and the whole team for all the support uh, during the process of organizing this conversation. And thank you, Deb and Maggie, for being here, for being one of the speakers at the upcoming Women Photographers International Archive Inaugural Congress. And I look forward with excitement to the conversation that we are going to have today. So please, if we go to the next slide, I will uh, dedicate the coming minutes to speak a little bit about what is WOFA, what is the Women Photographers International Archive, and why I created this organization. Women Photographers International Archive was founded in 2018 as an organization dedicated to research, promote, support, and educate about the contributions of those who identify as women in photography. Through the organization, I uh, established several um, programs or main activities which consist on uh, preserving primary source material and critical documents related to women and photography, offer reference services to universities and scholars to assist with uh, their long-term studies, as well as organize scholarly symposiums and letters, uh, curating digital and physical exhibitions, produce catal catalogs and books about women photographers. And also we have this program that we implemented, started implemented last year that the name is Wolfarams, in which we invite a women photographer to do a takeover in our um, Instagram platform weekly. And then we also have artists in resident programs, photography based workshops, and we one of the main um, uh, basis of the organization is the creation of online archives, uh, because the idea of accessibility and this notion of who has the right to access to archives, who has been the ones in charge of building history is crucial to the work that we are doing. So the organization is based in Miami. We don't have a physical space. In that sense, the partnership and the collaboration with different, different institutions is crucial to our work. And we can go to the next slide. And then I want to refer a little bit of the importance of making this organization and how the origins of it are focused on the, uh, in my first project catalog of Cuba women photographers that I started to work on in 2013. And at that moment, studies in the Cuban context um, uh, about photography work was very incipient, as you see here. Uh, from the thesis submitted for bachelor degree in art history and disserti dissertations for PhD in art science, only 1.8% of those theses were dedicated to photography. And if we go to the next slide, we can see how in main, some of the crucial books about um, Cuban photography history, in them, the lack of representation or the invisibility of women photographers was evident. And an example is this book, Apuntes, this was a specific, specifically an article, Apuntes para una historia de la fotografía en Cuba, 
which includes uh, only eight photographs by women photographers. That means two women photographers represented and 87 photographs identified as anonymous. As in today, is in our talk today, we are having as reference this book, uh, A Room of One uh, for One's Own by Virginia Woolf. And one of the reference that she used to, that she mentioned is that anonymous was a woman. So that for me, uh, make me the question of well, what happened if those women that we identified as anonymous were women. And if we go to the next slide, I only want to show another example of how in this book, for example, um, 100 years of Cuba, 100 years of photography only include five women photographers. And then from this total amount of 52 photographers represented. So when, uh, that's the beginning, of why I decided to create this project catalog of Cuban women photographers, which constitute the first approach to Cuban photography history from a feminist perspective and with an ambitious character goes from the uh, 2019 uh, to the 19th century, from the 19th century through the present. And if we go to the next slide, um, I want to emphasize how when I migrate to Miami in that process of adaptating to a new society uh, and we are to embracing le the Latinx identity and um, the notion of finding our own space or finding or, or creating our own spaces works crucial to me. And uh, one of the main questions that I have and I want to pose out is this of what sort of places dedicated to photography we need, how institutions and organizations think about photography, and finally, how we can subvert the patriarchal and colonial narratives of photography history. So this is one of the, uh, some of the ideas that, I, that are behind of my work with the organization. We can go to the next slide. And I want to highlight these two essential um, notions about the notion of place, thinking again on, um, on the importance of creating our own spaces, but how those spaces look like. And for me, uh, this notion of uh, the place as defined by feminist geographer and social scientist Doreen Massey in a global sense of place in which she defines the place as this evocative mix of people uh, of multiple ethnicities living and working side by side. And she says that a place is not static, it's not frozen in time, but rather a place is a process constituted by the social inter interactions that distinguish it from those side. I extrapolate this notion and associated it with the notion of borderline as we go to the next slide, as developed by Chicana feminist and theorist Gloria Saldua in which she refers to the borderland as the third space in which uh, people of multiple, from multiple nationalities converge, language cross-pollinate and are revitalized. This is crucial for me. And from this perspective, from embracing the border, the idea of living in the border as an international place, if from this context from which Women Photographers International Archive emerge, and from uh, where I position myself, as uh, and position my practice as an exercise of reading the history of photography from feminist and the colonial perspectives. So I want to highlight the upcoming Women Photographers uh, International Archive First Congress, WOFA Congress, if we go to the next slide, that will take place at PAM uh, in the upcoming November 18, 19, 2021, and in which Maggie and Deb are one of, the, one of the speakers that are participating in this exciting event in which 40 worldwide women photography organizations are collectives along with 30 uh, top art historians, prominent women photographers and curators will convene in person and virtual and online in Miami to discuss about what are the urgent contributions of women, uh, what are the urgent what are the urgent topics about uh, in the field of women and photography today? And to start this conversation about feminism, I consider that it makes sense to revisit the book, uh, A Room of One's Own 
that constitute one of the um, main or one of the books of extraordinary influence to the modern feminist agenda, um, to the modern feminist agenda. So I consider um, important to revisit the work of Virginia, who she was the great niece of Julia um, Margaret Cameron, but also how photography was crucial in her practice uh, being herself a photographer and with an archive of approximately 1,000 photographs uh, collected in photo albums that is available in some institutions, and also how she considered photography, uh, the idea of exchanging photography with some friends and colleagues and female friends. So during the, I think I will go, I will let now my start because for me, when I was thinking on how guiding our conversation today, I thought a lot about her project, The Secret Garden of Lily La Palma, and how that refers with the idea of creating our own spaces. So well, we will uh, thank you so much all for being here, and we will continue the conversation. Okay, thank you, Aldeida. Um, and I'm very happy to be here, and especially uh, with you and Deborah Willis, and thanks to Lucy Foundation, which is always so generous and always so supportive in so many ways, and especially of women. So we love them for that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I've had the good fortune to be in this business for a long time, but I came to a point where I felt like I wanted to have a room of my own and to reinvent myself in that room. And um, because I long had the great privilege to tell the stories of others. And that fascinates me. And that's really what I've always been interested in. But I came to this point where I thought, well, I've lived a long time and I've worked in this business a long time. And I've told stories, so many stories. So privileged to tell so many stories, actually. But I think I need to tell my story now. And I don't care whether it's a story for the public doesn't matter to me at all, but um, I needed to create a, a room of my own, a safe place where I could start to plant new ideas and keep them secret until they really blossomed more and where I could be fearless and do whatever I wanted to. And so these pictures started to come out of me quite, quite easily and just sort of, I would be walking along and I would see something. And anyway, all of these things started to happen. And then I thought about all of the experiences I've had in my life, some of them have been uh, quite challenging uh, and others have been extraordinary. So a lot of the pictures that you see are uh, either my thoughts about things or my beliefs in things or things I've seen, things I've experienced. And I don't always tell people what the pictures mean, but I give them a title. So this is the saint and um, this is, one of the characters in the secret garden. And what I love about the secret garden is this, anything can be there, anything can happen, anything can, can show up there. And there's, um, everyone is welcome except people with big egos. <laughs> That's what I decided. Those would be the ones, no, no, <laughs> boring, who cares, go away. So we want this to be a happy place. And I also wanted it to be a place where I could deal with some very, very serious, things. And so anyway, this is the saint. So we can go to the next image. Next. Okay. This is uh, the title to this is the um, sorry, the sacred heart of an innocent boy. And it has to do with child molestation, actually. Um, that I'm not going to really talk too much about here. But it uh, references things that happened to me and to other people, a lot of friends, and a lot of them were women, uh, which happens to us. But there were also uh, men who were affected by things like this. But I wanted to make a picture that really spoke to this idea of sacredness and sometimes what is taken from you when bad things happen, and especially to us as children. So that's what this picture is about. Um, and the next one. So I grew up without a father. I, my parents were married and they divorced when I was six months old. And my father really wasn't in my life. But my mother 
always told me, look, you're really lucky because you get to decide what you want to think about men and based on their behavior without being influenced in any way. And I really liked that idea. Um, and so as I grew up, and of course, just as with everybody, no matter the gender, no matter where you're from, uh, you'll see both good and bad behavior. But um, one of the things I really liked to think about men in general was that almost all of them had a gentle side and that that was what we look for in people anyway, is this sort of gentle side, uh, the good part of what somebody is. And so I started photographing male friends who I thought had these characteristics. And this is the first picture I took. And um, it's man born from blossoms. So I tried to create this whole series. And in fact, this is becoming its own series. And it's about uh, working through my own history. Again, part of, partly for the bad things that happened, uh, but also for the good people that I've met. And I also think in this moment of Me Too, where we women and men, and uh, however you identify, uh, have been able to have a voice and speak out about the things that happened to us. And um, I think this makes this series particularly important because I also think that we have to be careful not to lose the balance of things because there are some very good uh, male identifying people who have done great things for us. And in fact, um, coming up in this business, I have to say uh, there were always more male photo editors than females. Now it's kind of switched, which is wonderful. Um, but it, so it was always men in this business who moved me forward and had faith. And it wasn't because I was a great photographer, but I worked so hard and they saw that. And I might have had to go do something 10 times, but when they saw how hard I worked, they said, okay, let's give this one a chance. Um, but it also fought against this idea, I think that came up with male photo editors who didn't invest in women because there was this tendency to think that, well, women, you know, they're gonna fall in love, they're gonna get married, they're gonna have children, and then they won't really be able to work. And I always thought that's not true. You know, there's no harder job than being a mother, first of all. So to all the mothers, I take my hat off. You're brave, courageous women, and God bless you, um, brave women. Um, but I had to, I wanted to recognize, I wanted people to recognize that because it was a male heavy in every way uh, business, that uh, those were the guys who were gonna move you ahead. And it wasn't because of something untoward you might've done, but pardon me, but because they just, you know, saw how hard people would work. And so that was the beginning of really trying to change the way that men thought about women photographers. And I like to think that that's what my mission was as much as getting to be a better photographer and telling stories. So I thought if I can show them uh, that women are just as good and maybe even better at things, then this was going to be a wonderful thing to do. And in fact, um, in being a photo editor, I was the first woman photo editor to be hired by the AP in New York. And I knew this was on my shoulders now to show them that women can do this and maybe even better. And then I was the first woman uh, director of photography at the Miami Herald. And I'm proud to say that I changed a lot of things there on behalf of women. So there's lots of ways in this business that we as individuals, no matter if you're a photographer, photo editor, whatever you do, a teacher, um, a writer, an artist, that we can really have a lot of influence on changing the shape and the ideas of women and feminism in this business. Let's go on to the next because I'm talking too much. So let's go to the next picture. Oh, okay. So uh, one of the things, so I'm somebody who does a lot of long-term projects. I've worked in Haiti over a 30 year period, 
country that I love most in the world. And I'm so sad that it never gets, it's never recognized for what it really is capable of being and doing. But um, anyway, uh, and I, I love telling these long form stories. I did uh, lots of projects like this and that led me to uh, sometimes getting some of the more difficult assignments. So for three years, uh, many thanks to the National Geographic for giving me an assignment to work on a story about face transplants. And I spent three years, not every day, but with this extraordinary family, the Stubble uh, Fields, whose young daughter, Katie, who was quite beautiful, blew her face off with a rifle in a suicide attempt because a boy broke her heart and he, in a bad way. Um, and so she had no face. So they had to create a face and then she had multiple operations. Anyway, uh, this is the family after uh, Katie had this really terrible surgery that inserted this apparatus in her eyes that had to literally be the turning of the screws every day to bring her bone structure a little closer together to support a new face if there was one that became available. Next picture. And I really fell in love with this family and they let me in. It was amazing. Uh, but Katie and I would often, and it was hard to understand Katie because she, her mouth was changed the shape and she couldn't really speak very well. But after a day or two with her, you could understand. But we talked a lot about what happened to her and uh, but her, her parents are so supportive. And I was, I always, when I would go to visit them, I would always try to do a really beautiful portrait of Katie in case that was going to be it. And uh, so I was setting up my lights one day to photograph in this beautiful ballroom and Katie and her father started dancing and singing to each other. And it's little moments like this that I think we're always looking for that are so humane. Okay, next one. And this is Katie after she received a donated face. Uh, grandmother uh, had a granddaughter who overdosed and with drugs and was not going to make it. And so the hospital in Cleveland uh, talked to the grandmother and told them Katie's story. And the grandmother decided that this would be a great way for her granddaughter to live on. And so Katie got a new face. And this is after the surgery. And you can see it's literally sewn on like this. But um, Katie still has the face. Um, and she's still struggling to see better and to speak better. But she's, I have to say, she's an amazing person. And this is why I think we all like to tell stories is because we get to deal with amazing people, whether they're in history or whether they're right in front of us. And I just, uh, I'm really grateful to the Stubble Binds for being so open to me and we're still good friends and I'm gonna go see Katie again soon. Um, and I think that's it. I don't think there's any more images. No? <laughs> yes, no, maybe so? Yeah. I think. Yeah. There, okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you, so. Thank, thank you so much, Maggie. And now Deb. Right. You Thank you, Maggie. Um, <laughs> this was a what an inspiri inspirational story to follow. Um, I um, the title of the first slide is um, can we go back to the first slide? Is um, the work women's work never praised, never done, and this was a a phrase that a friend um, Rose Desiano. Um, shared with me when we working on a project together and knowing that aspect of it and thinking about that phrase, we can go to the next slide, just to think about the work that we as women photographers, it's, it's often never praised and never done in terms of completed. But um, my work is, is about storytelling as well. And I, I really believe that the aspects of uh, the bodies of my work, which is long-term focused on beauty, um, looking at the experience of how do we tell stories about everyday life, but also tell stories that basically transform our lives. 
I created a project um, in terms of in pursuit of beauty. And, and so it, it, can, it continues through how we think about storytelling, how we unite in beauty shops, how do we think about the force of beauty in history, but also how beauty is denied um, in, in the storytelling specifically of black women. I'm just thinking about the, the subjects that we, we're all sharing. Um, this is a work um, by, I photographed Carrie Mae Weems in a beauty shop in Eatonville, Florida. Interested in following the history of Zora Neale Hurston and her story of, of telling um, as an anthropologist, but also as a filmmaker, but also growing up in Eatonville and what it meant to her in, in her life. And here Carrie is, is reimagining the, the body of and the beauty of uh, Zora Neale Hurston with creating the hairstyle, creating the place to tell the story. Can we have the next slide? And um, this recently is, last year was the 100 years in terms of the women, right for women to vote. And there's another project that I worked on with a group of women through Park Avenue Armory, 100 years, 100 women. I'm invited to curate a show, but also as a photographer, as you know, I live a dual life of curator, photographer. And I wanted to look at the archive of women who fought to vote, uh, fought for the right to vote. And you know there were black women in the ninth in the nineteenth century who fought, so their image is here. But I also wanted to use the concept of the clothesline. I think storytelling is central. Growing up in North Philly, having to, watching my mom put on um, you know hanging up clothes and talking in the backyard to the women next door or the women who passed by on the street because we lived on a corner house. Here's my mom in a beauty shop. Um, would we all know how um, we know that, um, as Tiffany Gill says, that um, it, beauty shops are subversive spaces. And just imagine women coming in to have citizenship classes, to talk about their love life, talk about their successes. And then this is the uh, headquarters of the colored women voters. I love this image in the archive. Uh, we see their shoes, we see their style of dress, we see their hat, but they see this commitment in terms of, of this. So I use sheets, pillowcases, and just creating the story. Next slide. And the names of the women, um, thinking of the photographs uh, of their stories but that are in the archives, but I wanted to use the phrases and their names and kind of hanging on these sheets. Uh, next slide. Also uh, working with the choreographer, uh, Jassy Johnson and dancer, Kevin Bozeman. Looking, I was working on a project on, on Civil War soldiers. And at the same time, Joan Baez had created a, a song um, called Civil War. I was invited to um, create a, a video, my first time making a music video, but I wanted to reflect on the experiences of the archive again. So I'm, I'm in the archive thinking about um, Black Civil War soldiers, thinking about slavery and, and family stories. And so this piece is called Reflections on, on Civil War. There is um, a family uh, photograph um, from the 1860s with the dancers um, and their shadows throughout. Can we go to the next slide? The importance of this is to think about women who uh, worked as cooks and spies um, during the Civil War, but how they dance in terms of the dance they had to play as free women um, to move around in an enslaved home over home, but also in terms of slave quarters and that, that experience to me. And this is something that we created together um, as Jossie and, and Kevin. Um, perform for the for the song. The next slide. Um, this is also another project. Um, I photographed uh, a woman by the name of Faith and of course my mother Ruth. Um, unfortunately, as 
we all know my mom is in the hospital now, so it's a real difficult time. But my mother is um, really strong and you know focused on um, the scripture. And here she's at church. She's holding on to her Bible. And, and I met a woman by the name of Faith who was uh, formerly incarcerated, who spent a number of years um, in prison, but also after her life in prison, transforming um, the life of other women. And she, her tattoo, she has um, the psalm on her hand um, that guided her through the experience and mom's song has, as well as where she is holding the Bible. But I thought their hands were central to the storytelling of women and how do we reflect on those moments and wanted to kind of marry these two moments together and both photographed the same year in 2019. Next slide. Also for a few years from 2018 to today, I've been photographing closets, women's stories, closets, telling their stories. And this is started in Florence at the Villa La Pietra in a woman's shoes, um, the archive of her gold shoes, um, Hortense, Hortense's shoes. And then the other image is, you know, a, a dress, kind of the, the horse dress, the, the kind of the framing of a possible dress or that a designer could create for um, Lana Turner, who is, uh, lives in Harlem, who's well known for her dance and her history and working in the archives. And then she has hundreds of hats and shoes and wanted to just spend time in her house and in her closet. Um, and, and the storytelling aspect of what it means to in pursuit of beauty, to think about this. We can go to the next slide. And this next slide is, the next slide please, of uh, Naima Sanchez, who was also uh, formerly incarcerated. And this is the final slide, the, the photographing her in her, which the clothes um, in prison, this project is called Points of Triangulation and also her tattoos and the dress and what it meant for her to pose in these, um, in her dress, but, but what, what story she wanted to tell with the, the tattoo, the framing of her, of her history, the notion of place and space as, as was mentioned earlier, but how um, her post um, life after um, being incarcerated, what she wanted to present in, in, in that sense. And then the next slide, is the mural, it's part of the mural arts project. And this is a mural. The photographs were um, used to create a mural of, of six people. And we see the image here of Naima and some of the others who were part of the project that I photographed. And it's going to be on a street at 21st Street and Philadelphia and um, Market Street. So I'd like to end here and um, respond to questions since we have about 20 minutes left. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Deb, um, for this presentation. And Maggie, I want to start our conversation making reference if we go back to this idea of Virginia Woolf that of course I have bring her here in our discussion, but there are, I want to recognize that there are a lot of other women that have been crucial contributors, theories, to the notion of feminism. And, uh, but I found that in this text, there are like main ideas that will help us to um, continue to explore some topics that I consider important to highlight. And I want to start asking you about how have been like the main challenge that you have faced. I know that um, when and, and where Deb is so, we have read and we know about your experience during your uh, years as a student and how it was, it was interesting for me to see how, for example, in the case of Maggie, she was speaking about the solidarity from her male counterparts in terms of how they opened the doors for her. But I know that in your case, that was 
always like the limit was there in the case of men. So I think that I would like to explore a little bit more about those challenges that you have faced. You are both incredible, successful um, intellectuals, women photographers, artists, scholars. So I, I, I would like, I think that would be inspiring for me as well <laughs> to know uh, how you have dealt with that process of creating your space, but at the same time, those challenges that we find in the way to make it happen. Yeah, I, I'd like to start. I'm, I'm proud to hear Maggie, Maggie had the support <laughs> that she had. Um, I was denied that support by, um, by my um, counterparts in terms of in the classroom. I had one male professor, but most of the women in my life supported my work. I was told that I was taking up a good man's space and in a, in a room full of 18 male photographers and three women. So, so my work um, was pushed forward by other women and by the notion of making a space. And, and so that notion for me was to think about how biography is essential um, autobiography is essential for me as, as a way to tell our stories. How do we explore you know, cultural traditions and perceptions? And how do we make a space um, to link identities? And finding that is having someone telling me no made me stronger and more determined to find a space uh, for my voice and my photographs. And that was crucial for me as an ongoing project to start a, a project looking for black photographers, looking for women photographers and to create publications and exhibitions so other people could see the range of work um, that, have, that have been pre presented and portrayed of women um, in that way. So that's why I thought it was really important for me to continue the work even without the support of my teachers. Yeah, I have a similar, I, well, I had a similar experience. I, I remember when I was in the school, I my first uh, approach to Cuban photography and I was, I started to be interested in the world of women photographers. And I found a t-shirt that told me where well, there is no good women photographers. And that, that makes me no, yes, of course they are. And I, 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 that was, yeah, that was the beginning. I just said, okay, I will create this catalog comprehensive and even you know people were telling me where well, you are having like you know too many legs it's too wide you need to re restrict the limit your your you yes. researching project mm -hmm. but I said I want to make this because I need to make evident all those women that have been contributors uh, to he of history and, and at the same time speaking about the contribution to the modern life if we think historically on those women that also were activists and contributed in the case of the um, of the Cuban context to uh, the process of transformation that the that the country was uh, experiencing, if we think in the um, were pre 1959, in that that is one of the periods that I have been researching, and then um, I will and then we're right now with Wafa how still I keep this strong focus on producing rigorous knowledge um, about the artistic production from Central American and the Caribbean that still I consider is an, uh, an area that needs to research, uh, that needs a lot of work to be done in terms of rewriting this, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, this um, uh, re history of, uh, of photography, that process of rewriting and reframing the the how photography has been written and then maggie you want to say something well i i want to clarify something um i i think it's always been very difficult for women and any artistic endeavor uh and so even though it was because there were so many male photo editors they moved me forward but let me make something very clear when i went to apply for my first job out of school I was told that we don't hire women. We have an opening at this small paper in Galveston, Texas, but we're not hiring women for that position. And so I went out and I found a story. I photographed it, I wrote it, a story that everybody was talking about in this small town that the paper hadn't published. And the next day I went back to the paper and I said, here's a story for you. And that managing editor who 
fussed at me and said, you, you know, I told you, I told you, we're not hiring a woman, a woman for this job. And I said, well, look, look, read this and look. And he did and he sighed. And then he said, okay, you know what? You've got the job because the two men we were considering would never have gone to this trouble. And they gave me a job. And I have to credit my mother who was a scientist and talk about speak, working in a male world, this world of science is still very far behind in recognizing the contributions of women scientists. But she taught me, you can do this or you can find a way around it. You can knock your head up against the wall or you can find a way around it. And that is what I always had in my mind when somebody would say, no, you're not good enough. No, you can't do this. No, we don't want you, you're a woman, you know, all of these things. And I just always thought there must be a way around this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and even if I have to prove myself much more, which was true many, many times than a male photographer, I said, okay, I'm gonna do that. I'll take the challenge, I'm gonna do that. And uh, I think, so it wasn't without hard work. And when I was a picture editor, I had very untoward things said to me by men, oh, you don't belong here. You know, you should be home pregnant and uh, in the kitchen. And um, I've been knocked to the ground by male photographers when I was photographing uh, in places like Haiti where big things were going on and I would be knocked to the ground so they could get the picture. And it's not to, I didn't want to make it sound like it was a walk in the park, but um, I'm just determined not to be held back. And because then there's this wonderful thing that happens later on in your career, if you can keep going, and that is that you get to really move other people forward. And I think that this is where I'm at right now. It, it gives me so much personal joy to move, especially women and people of color uh, are my main you know, focus. And I think back about whatever we've gone through to get to here, we learned a lot and, um, and now we can use what we learned to move other people forward. And I do feel like things are opening up a lot more, but they still have a lot of work to do. And I'm, I, like so many other photographers um, lately are so worried that there's this, you know, sort of moment of embrace and embracing everybody, recognizing that everybody is, can be who they are and they should be who they are because it makes everything richer. But then will the photo editors or will publications fall back into the old, um, or uh, in the case of um, education, I think, boy, talk about a war zone. That's because I taught for three years at a university and it's really, um, it's- I wanted, I wanted to ask you about it. Um, you have mentioned that notion of, and I think that we three can agree on that, that is the notion of excellence and how sometimes we feel that we are, you know, that we are alone because we also need to be struggling and thus, and we need to be in that process of always be better and trying to be the best that we can. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard work that we, uh, that what implies that we need to constantly be pushing ourselves beyond the limits. And I want to, um, another crucial element that is the, uh, the importance of education. And of course we are, when I speak about this process of trying to be better all the time, it's because we live in a patriarchal system that, does not, that doesn't necessarily is responding to us. So how do you think the things have changed in academy? Or, uh, and also because we're specifically in terms of the professor, but also how photography is being teach at this moment and uh, what it needs, what it still needs to be done in that regards. And also I want to know if you consider that women photographers is a subject curriculum to have in the, in the schools. Hmm. Well, I think that um, it's really important to also note that with, at teaching at NYU, the number of, of women, uh, young women who are applying for the program, it is it's astounding. It's, it's really important to think that they are 
focused on their future. They understand that they're committed to telling um, a different narrative, a different story. They they know the histories. I mean, you know, we we know how uh, social media has affect uh, affected all of us in terms of what happened over the past um, twenty months. But the silencing of women's voices is no longer um, based on social media, and we have a number of students who are applying. Um, they some of them apply, and they're they're already actively um, in the field. They are activists, they are fashion um, photographers, they're telling different stories. And so I really think that we now see um, kind of um, looking at the whole aspect of migration. And, and Maggie, I know you've been a part of that narrative for a long time, but to think about how do we retell and re-examine and consider images of, of women through the lens of women photographers has um, really been um, an important point for us today. And if we reflect on that future, I see that a number of women are um, st studying photography and, and teaching. And so they, um, and that's a, that's a pivotal um, change from um, the time when I was in photography in, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I, I, uh, my, I, I was teaching and now I teach workshops quite a bit as well. And there's always more women and they have great ideas and it's so exciting to see what they're doing. But even in, in the academic moment that I was in, there were always more women students and they were very serious and they were inventive. So there, it, there has been a swing to the other way, I think. Uh, in a good way that needed to happen because, um, yeah, academia, academia is a whole other thing. You all are so brave to be doing it, but, um, uh, but it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a battleground, but I think sometimes it is. Uh, and so we really have to be glad to see that these changes are happening. Because otherwise, even, and nothing against male teachers, but they're always going to have a different point of view about the world, or even white people who teach uh, are gonna have a different experience with the world. And they're going to teach according to what their experience is and what shaped them. And that leaves out a whole bunch of other things. Not to, I'm not trying to vilify anybody, but it's a fact. I mean, we have to recognize it. This is what's changing, and uh, and it couldn't be too soon. It couldn't have happened sooner. I wish it had happened sooner, but it can really. Uh, it's really exciting to see women telling stories about women. And yeah. but just your description of being pushed down in in Haiti for that 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 but, shot. And that not by a Haitian. It wasn't by a Haitian. It was mm -hmm. by an American mm -hmm. American male photographer. Right. But just that notion of, you know, push bound because they recognize, I mean, just the injustice of that because they want to make a story that or make that print or make that Pulitzer Prize um, object. But the value that you've been in Haiti and in other places for a long time, photographing protests and, and, and other um, moments in Haiti says a lot to the idea of being determined um, to continue to use your camera um, and be persistent about that. And I think that that's a story that, that we all need to know um, about as, as, as students of photography. Yeah, another important element is how that I have noticed that is, and that's why, for example, in the, in the Congress, we are bringing together all, all of these women photography organizations and collectives, because it's really there, um, if we indeed notice that it is, there is an increase in the number of women in the classrooms, also when they graduated, they don't have that a lot of opportunities in terms of hiring positions or even access to gallery exhibitions or uh, opportunities. That's why these uh, new, well, all the programs that Lucy Foundation does also are very helpful in this process of constantly having different prices or different portfolio reviews that we have also because of the pandemic, I think, 
uh, we have seen a lot of and the and how we have this access uh, or having the opportunity to be with each other online but we see an explosion in terms of uh, the amount of portfolio reviews or competitions for photographers and for women photographers that being uh, that have been created from also women photography organizations and collectives. So I think that's crucial. I have a question from the audience and they are asking uh, you, Deb, how many other programs in photography are directed by women like you? And what is your peer circle on the academic side? Hmm. How many other programs in, you know, in terms of um, academic programs? Is that what? Yeah, mm -hmm. the question is how many other programs in photography are directed by well, women like you? <laughs> 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 um, I haven't, there's no survey yet, so I, I'm not sure, but I am a member of the Society for Photographic Education. I'm, I'm a member of the College Art Association. And um, the whole aspect, and that's from Michelle Don Marsh, who I know has been very active in um, exploring and, and identifying the voices of women. But um, I would say that it's really important for us to acknowledge these um, the curators and, and, and act and people like Michelle, who um, at the Northwest and in terms of you know, Northwest Center and, and, and Seattle, Aperture, and in terms of the work of women who have spent time, you know, not in front of the camera, but making sure that we're published, um, that we are exhibited, and that our work, the, the circulation of our work is ongoing. So I'm not sure how many other programs, but I, I'm sure that that's a great project to consider. It, you know, one of the, um, um, Lori Novak is my colleague and, and Mary Virginia Swanson is also a colleague, and they are both constantly looking at programs to talk to other students um, about how to become a photographer, how to work in the field of photography. And so that's really important for, I'm gonna ask them about that circulation. And, and when, we, when students apply, we always wonder where else did they apply and why us in terms of NYU, why Tisch? But it's, it's, a, it's an important question, but I don't have an, that I don't have an answer to. I, um, yeah, I think I would like to, to have, I know we have some minutes still, and I would like to take the opportunity to speak a little bit about the notion of feminist photography and your thoughts on that. And, um, and this uh, important idea of creating our own language. So what does it look like for you? What is feminist photography for you? If we can quickly uh, speak a little bit about it. Maggie? Oh, I'm sorry, I was reading a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, teacher, teacher, I wasn't paying attention. Um, <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, to highlight a little bit about this notion of feminist photography and what does it look like for you? Oh, well, I think, um, first of all, I'm so happy because I'm everywhere I look, there are women telling stories and uh, about women, but other things as well because I think when a woman looks at something, she sees something then uh, different than a male mind, or I don't want to, or feminine identifying people as well. Um, and certainly people of various colors. So I think that we're seeing uh, so many stories and where I really saw a big change, uh, just in terms of being right in front of your eyes. Okay, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, promoting any particular publication, but National Geographic really did a 360 degree turn where they started hiring many, many more women, women of all kinds uh, and um, telling stories about women. And they've really done a big turnaround and on racial issues as well. But, um, but I think you saw that in a lot of publications and also there are far more women photo editors now and they are moving women ahead. And that's really exciting as well. And I think all over the globe, that's true. But um, I think there's very much a feminist kind of story being told. 
Yeah, I'm important. A lot of people. I mean, it's it's becoming there's that that's in the air more that you know we want to know stories about women and what women have gone through and how they've coped with things or how they overcame things or what are their ideas and how do they make things and how do they dream and what are their dreams about and how are they going to raise their children for this future that's so unsettling actually and uh, in terms of climate change and you know and I really this is I love being a woman I think that we are so much freer than men in so many ways uh, but we have to claim that and um, and also I just feel like there's been it's the feminist kind of storytelling has been quiet except for a few people have broken through that but um, I think this is a moment when there's just really a lot of wonderful storytelling just not only in uh, photography but in art and writing uh, in programs and how uh, people are even raising their daughters which is a hugely important thing that you know we have to raise our daughters to be confident and not be diminished or felt to be diminished so i feel like all of those things are going on right now so i i know we have a lot more work to do and there is but i'm so happy to be alive still and see this happening because there's so many stories to be told and so many ways to tell them and it's so exciting and to have something like uh, the conference that you planned, uh, Alveda, it's yeah. amazing that you are pulling this off and it's, it's terrific. And I hope a lot of people come because it's a real celebration of feminism. And that word has also opened up and become uh, more inclusive about what feminism is about, I think. Uh, so. I think there's a lot more to be done, but I think so much has changed and I'm thrilled. And I, I hope that women embrace this moment and really become part of it. It's this movement, but, and not just for themselves, but on behalf of all women. Yes. You know, there but are women who are still kept down so low. Uh, Native American women have a lot of stories to tell and women in other countries and so. Yeah, thank you so much. I have another, uh, one last question that is where well, it's about what we can expect for the WOFA Congress. And I am here um, like suffering because we have a lot of things to discuss. There is another important question that is about um, um, how many that how we have been speaking, how many have been speaking about the feminine gaze and how do we think is the uh, female way of photographing. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to the, um, uh, to register for the coming WAFA Congress. These are some of the topics that we will be discussing about education, about feminist photography, about language, about queer identities in photography, as well as um, when who has the right or who makes feminist photography as well, and the notion of the female gaze. So I invite you to uh, go to the WOFAS website uh, at wopha.org and our social media WOFA Foundation, and then subscribe to the Congress. We happen in person and online, and I would love to continue this conversation, but, uh, but yeah, it will happen in November. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aldeide, Maggie, and Deborah for participating today. We're grateful for your vision, your advocacy, your work. Um, thank you, Wolfa, for Wolfa for co-hosting <laughs> this talk and the work that you do. This conversation is recorded on the Lucy Foundation's website, YouTube channel. So if you've missed anything or would like to listen again, please go to the Lucy Foundation and find our YouTube channel. To our audience, thank you for coming and um, have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank Deb, you. and thank you, Maggie, for your time, for being here, and see you in November. Okay. See everyone and in thank November. You, thank you, Lauren and Ali. See you too as well. <laughs> in November. Thank you, Ali. Well, in November. Thank you. <laughs>